Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. If you would like to follow along, we'll be in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, if you would like to join us. Um, While you're turning there, I want to welcome everyone to our visitors. We're glad you came by, and uh, we hope that if you have any questions, that you will ask them, or you'll let us get a chance to meet you and, and learn more about you, and you about us. And to our regular members that, uh, again, we're glad you're here, whether here physically or by electronically. So Luke chapter 4, this is the story of Jesus being tempted in the desert. So to give ourselves a little bit of a background, uh, Jesus has just been baptized. So Matthew's account gives us that, that Jesus has been, just been baptized and the Holy Spirit has come down upon him. He has not started his ministry yet. He has not called any of his disciples yet. And the Holy Spirit has now led him to the wilderness to be tempted. So we see the significance of this event, that this isn't just, hey, this is a big deal, or this is to find out who the big kid on the playground is. But this is the showdown between Jesus and Satan. Everything is at stake here. If Jesus fails... Then, then God's plan fails. If Jesus fails, all of humanity is now lost. So in Luke chapter 4, starting verses 1 and 2, it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. So we see the situation now, that Jesus is preparing himself to begin his ministry. We're going to see that in the next few chapters if we were to continue on. So Jesus is getting ready to start his ministry. He's getting ready to start calling his disciples. But he's gone into the wilderness and he's fasting during this time. We see that he is alone in the desert and that he has not eaten for 40 days. So I did a search and it says that those who have voluntarily stopped eating or maybe like a uh, participating in some type of hunger strike, typically can't last more than 45 to 60 days. So the 40 days that Jesus is getting here, he's going to be very hungry, he's going to be very weary, and things are going to be very difficult for him. So these 40 days is when he's reaching his limits. So we see that this is when Satan is now coming out to take his shots at Jesus. He's struggling to try and attack him when he's alone, when he's physically drained, when he thinks Jesus is at his weakness. We note here in verse 2 that Luke adds something that Matthew doesn't in this account. It says, for 40 days being tempted by the devil. So this isn't, hey, there's these three temptations and Satan moves on. But it implies that Satan has been tempting him for these full, the full time that he's been out there. He's been trying to come up with some way to draw Jesus away from God. These three temptations that we have may just be an accumulation of of the last three. It may be these are the big ones that, that Satan was trying. But again, Satan was trying in any way to lead Jesus away from God. Verses 3 and 4. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. So, this is a very simple thing, and we think, boy, Jesus has been in the wilderness all this time. He's got to be starving. I mean, hunger has got to be a big item on his mind. We think of an example of, hey, we're going to have a medical test the next morning, and they want us to fast for 10 hours. It's like, wow, 10 hours? I don't know if I can do that. Or I'm really hungry as soon as that test is over. I want to go find something. Jesus has been doing this for 40 days. And so the temptation of saying, hey, turn this stone into bread, we think, boy, that could almost be a legitimate reason. You're fasting, you have the ability, and you have these stones. Let's just turn it to bread so that you can be fulfilled. So we want to note here that Satan is not saying, If you are the son of the God, like, I don't know who you are, I just happen to run across you here in the wilderness. But he's saying, if you are the son of God, which you are, you have these abilities. You have this talent, you have this power. What you need to do is 
to use that ability and turn this stone into bread. And so what he's trying to do is trying to draw Jesus away from God and be independent of what God wants. So, so he's going to say, you know, aren't you hungry? I mean, can't you, can't you see this? Isn't this something you can do? So the challenge might be to us today that there are things going on in our lives. Maybe we're hungry. Maybe we're, we're struggling financially. Maybe we're struggling with health issues. And we want to do something, and we're going to do this independent of what God wants. So Satan is trying to tempt Jesus to follow the same pattern. What you need to do is take your power, your ability, and do this. And so we see that Satan is trying to come and assist Jesus. I'm going to do what I think is best for you. And we know that Satan is trying to draw him away. And Jesus realizes this as, as well. We often all experience the I wants and the I needs. And some of these even seem noble at this time. We think of, you know, if you were to put a list of priorities of things that I really want, I think food would be on that every day. And so again, he's trying to draw Jesus away. Jesus' response is a very simple one. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Now this is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And so this is when the people of Israel were in the wilderness and they were complaining because they didn't have water. And this is when Moses brings water from the rock. And they were questioning him by saying, where is God? Why isn't he here helping us? We have these problems. Why isn't he doing something about it? And so I think Jesus is, in using this example, man shall not live by bread alone. He's trying to say things are not about the physical. They are not about our personal satis satisf satisfaction. Sorry. <laughs> it's not living independent of God, but true living is doing what God wants us to do and depending upon Him. The spiritual life is more important than the physical. I'm not getting my things. I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting all my desires. These are not the things of true life. But here Jesus is revealing that real living is following God and dealing with what He provides for us. True life doesn't come from this physical. Jesus is saying to Satan, no, my life is about serving God. That's what's most important. If he doesn't provide me with this food, if he doesn't provide me with those things that I think I need, I'm sure he has a reason for it. He's trying to get Jesus to do this independent of God. Where is God at this time? You have the ability. Why not just say, go and turn this bread into, this stone into bread, and you can take care of this issue yourself, even though God is not doing it for you. So we need to watch ourselves if we say, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Am I doing this because this is what God has planned? Is it because this is what I'm dealing with? I'm working through that. Or are we trying to do things independent of God? The next temptation that Satan brings, and the devil took him up and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and he said to him, To you I will go all of this authority and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. So again, I think this becomes really a very serious temptation for Jesus. He's looking to offer him a shortcut. Jesus knows why he came to this earth. He came to this earth to be a sacrifice for each one of us. He's going to suffer on the cross. He's going to be ridiculed. He's going to be abandoned by his friends. Satan is saying, I can skip all of that. I can let you bypass those pains, those sufferings, those trials hanging on the cross. All you have to do is fall down 
and worship me. You won't have to hang there until you're dead. You won't have to deal with all of these other people. I'll just give it to you. And so this temptation is Jesus is looking at, I mean, so we remember when Jesus is in the garden and his sweat became his blood. So this was a very strenuous thing for Jesus. He asked, is there any other way we can do that? Satan is making that offer. I'm willing to give you an option to bypass that. You can avoid all of that suffering. What about us? There's times that we want to give up for our comforts. We want to give up so that we don't have to suffer, so that we don't have to deal with maybe the pain that we're looking for, that we're looking at. So I also want to bring to you that uh, what Satan is offering is very real. In order for something to be a temptation, there has to be a possibility, a reality. Satan says that I have this authority, and Jesus confirms that in John chapters 12, 14, and 16. He calls him the ruler of this earth. Satan is saying, I'm going to give you this. I have that power. I have that authority at this time to give this to you. And so this is a way that he could be tempting Jesus to say, bypass all of that. So we look at Jesus' response. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you will serve. So again, this is a very simple answer. Again, this comes from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And so he's telling him that it's only God. It doesn't matter what the other situations are. It's God that I need to follow. It's God that I need to serve. So we often think of, okay, we have God as number one, and family is number two, and church, and job, and, and, and the list can go on. And we might say, okay, we give God 85% and our family 12% and church 2% and our job. And we just keep going down. But I think what Jesus is trying to say is that this is not a pie chart. That we have God is number one and there's not a number two. That everything that we do is because we serve God. Because we worship God. And so... The way we treat our spouse, the way we raise our children, when we go to work, the effort that we put in is not because, oh, you got your 4%, but yet it's because I'm worshiping God and these are the things that I need to do. So everything we do is because of the way we worship God. And so again, Satan is tempting him a way to get out of all this pain and suffering, but yet instead Jesus says, nope, that's not the way I'm going to do it. I'm supposed to worship God and him only. He's telling us that if we have to suffer, we will worship God. If we have to give up our family, we will worship God. If we're stuck in poverty, if we're stuck in financial problems, we will worship God. We will worship God and no one else. The third one is, and he took him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle in the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw down yourself from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hand they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Again, we see Satan is trying to tempt Jesus. So those first two, Jesus' response is with a passage from Deuteronomy. And so this is not a Satan's going, oh, I didn't think about that when I should have read my Deuteronomy before I got here. But yet Satan is saying that I will take Scripture and try and twist it for my needs as well. So he's, he's trying to use this passage, which comes from Psalms chapter 91, which it really is talking about God is going to provide, he's going to protect his own, and so he, what he's saying is actually a true statement. You know what? If Jesus, if you jump from this, 
I believe that angels would have came down and protected him and caught him. But what he's saying is not used the proper way. So just because the scripture is quoted doesn't mean that it's used in the way that God intended it to be used. So do we think those angels would have came? I do. I think that they would have protected him. But the question now becomes of putting the God to the test. So is Jesus trying to show his loyalty, his righteousness, his piety, piety, piousness? Sorry. Again? And so he's, is he doing that and saying, okay, God, I'm going to show you how much I trust you, and I'm going to jump from this, from this pinnacle. Instead, he needs to not tempt God. So Jesus' response is, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, this comes, to, comes from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6. And again, it's the people were murmuring, they were complaining, and they were not showing their allegiance to God. Where is God at this time? Why isn't he taking care of me? And Satan is trying to dim trying to tempt Jesus so that he can show that he is faithful to God. And so our question might be, do we do things like that? Do we put God to the test? Maybe not, I'm going to jump off of a building and expect him to catch me. But do I say, God, if you protect me on this, case, on this situation, if you heal me, you solve this financial problem, then I will do this. Are we putting God to the test and saying, this is what I want you to do for me, rather than I'm just worshiping and following you? And it comes back to what is our motive? Are we thinking of ourselves rather than God's fulfillment or purpose? Jesus is saying not to tempt God in any situation. Most of the time we would think of those when When times are difficult, again, maybe thinking of when it's problems financially, when it's health, when it's someone we care about, but then also in times of comfort, times of good. You might think, God, look at what I've been doing. How about if you do something for me? Are we tempting God in those situations as well? We should not try to prove ourselves in allegiance to God but we should just honor and worship him. The passage ends with, and the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. We see Satan came at him at any way that he can. He tested him, he tried him, he tried to convince him, he tried to use scripture, He tried to use everything against Jesus, but it tells us that he's coming back, that he's going to do that again. We don't necessarily have those recorded incidents, but there was probably temptations that were in Jesus' thoughts of, hey, I can get out of this. How am I going to overcome that? And Satan is saying, I'm going to come back again. And How is that for us? How does he do that towards us? That if we are successful in overcoming some temptation, do we say, oh, I'm good, that's no more? Or is there a concern that Satan said, okay, I, saw, I tried this one and that one, that one didn't work this time, but I'm coming back for you again. I'm going to see what I can do to draw you away from God. Those that are uh, strayed from God, those are easy to maintain. You poke a little thing for him and say, here's some benefit. But if you're trying to do God's will, he's coming after you. He's coming after all of us. And so again, he's looking for a more opportune time, just as he did for Jesus. So the the, uh, different temptations here basically show, where's your loyalty? They were asking Jesus, where's your loyalty? Are you willing to work independent of God and turn this bread into or the stone into bread? 
Are you willing to bow down to someone else to forego pain and suffering? Are you willing to leave God for what something that we want? And then also, are we willing to put God to the test? Are we willing to, and the analogy is jump from the pinnacle. Are we willing to say, God, catch me, because I'm showing you how much faith I have in you. But instead, we should be looking at it. This is our way to worship and honor and trust him. So in the passage that, uh, that Josh read for us, Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tipped as we are, yet without sin. So how many of us feel from time to time, it's like, oh, this is an everyday occurrence. Seems like there's something new every day that's against me. How many of us are caught up in, I have my issues and I'm trying to deal with them, and are not putting our trust and our faith in God? We see that we have someone who has done this, that has gone through sin, temptation, just as we have. Yet he did this without sin, and that's what makes Jesus the perfect sacrifice when he went to the cross, that he was able to overcome that that we haven't been able to. For all have fallen short and have sinned, but Jesus made it through. That test that he went through, he had to be perfect. It wasn't a, this is a 99% test and you did really well. He had to be perfect. He had to get every situation. And again, as Luke says, this was happening for 40 days. How many of us in that type of physical condition of, of hunger, of weakness, of aloneness, would, would, would make it through that? Who would say, man, I have the ability to make these changes, and I'm going to take them. But yet, Jesus did this without sin. So as we discuss this morning, or as we think this morning, we have the opportunity to make ourselves right with God. That sacrifice that Jesus went through, that perfectness that he supplied on the cross, was for us. He had the opportunity to bypass it, to skip it, but he didn't take it because God had a plan and he followed what God wanted to do. So we ask you this morning, if you have a need, to come forward as we stand and sing.